But I just want to welcome each of you from uh, our Constance Free Church staff. If you're from another church or from one of our colleges around, we're so glad you're here today and uh, trust that this will be a great day of learning for you. So let's uh, begin our time with a word of prayer and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Lord, we are so thankful for all of your tremendous goodness into our lives. You are a great God. We thank you for your great love for each one of us. And we know that you are our creator. You're the master of all eternity and inhabit it. Oh, the whole universe is your temple and heaven and earth declare your praises. And we as your people created in your image want to join in with that as well. We want to understand more of who you are and how you work in all of these different elements of the universe to show your glory. And so, Lord, I just pray that your presence, your spirit would minister to us today, that we would see your word and you more clearly today, that we would be drawn closer to you to this very day. So we commit this time to you and ask that you would superintend it in all of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to introduce to you Brian uh, Baderman from the McLaurin Institute down at the university. And we are partnering together today to make this event happen. And so we're so thankful for their part as well. So Brian, Lord bless you as you come. Grab this here. Uh well, good morning uh, to you all. My name, again, is uh, Brian Bademan. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces, but also uh, some new, new faces, um, new partners in uh, this conversation. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you and to be a part of sponsoring uh, this event with Constance Free Church. Uh, as Randy mentioned, I'm the director of McLaren CSF, uh, which is a Christian study center at the University of Minnesota, uh, many people don't realize uh, that there is a, a Christian study center at the University of Minnesota, so I often get the chance to introduce uh, uh, our community, uh, tell people uh, what we do and how we do it. Uh, and in a, nut, in a nutshell, uh, we're a community of students and faculty and church people, uh, like uh, many of you, uh, who want to take seriously the Christian faith's claims about knowledge and vocation, uh, which is to say uh, we want uh, to nurture public life faithfulness uh, or whole life faithfulness is another uh, phrase that you'll hear us using uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we believe that Christian discipleship requires as much for people uh, who spend their time around a university. Well, how does this happen? That's another uh, question uh, people ask. You know, how, how, do, how do you engage the university uh, from uh, the perspective of Christian faith? Let me just mention three ways. Uh, first, we have a Christian study center, uh, which is a place, a house, actually, uh, where students and others convene, uh, where uh, we host conversations and share meals. Uh, and we invite all of you to drop in. Uh, we're open uh, most uh, business hours. Um, it's a good jog, actually, uh, from Constance, uh, but Joel Halcom here assures me that it's only two turns, or is that from your house? That's from the house, but from the church it might be three or four, yeah. Uh, but second, um, uh, one of the other ways that we uh, advance these conversations is that we sponsor events like this, uh, most of them at the university itself. Um, and uh, at these uh, kinds of events, we uh, bring leading Christian thinkers in to explore how their faith informs their academic fields. Uh, next Thursday night, we're hosting uh, William Hurlbut of Stanford University to talk about uh, freedom and neuroscience. Uh, so if you're interested in that, there are details uh, back in the back at our I guess we've got a little table back there. Matt can wave for us. Um, but what's been most exciting uh, uh, is that uh, finally we've begun uh, to develop some curricular programs specifically designed for students at secular universities. 
Uh, and our curriculum provides resources and, again, a community for students at the university to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, as the Apostle Paul put it, and to begin to imagine what faithfulness means as students transition uh, uh, to vocations in the, quote, real world. So business, medicine, engineering, education, and uh, science. Um, I'm going to be around all day, uh, uh, up and down off the stage here. I'm here with a couple of uh, my colleagues, Andrew and Matt, back at the booth. Uh, please flag us down if you have questions. Um, there's a table in the back with some literature. Uh, I think we have a, a bibliography uh, that you can pick, pick up that um, will give you some ways to continue this very conversation on uh, faith and science. Uh, but now it's my great honor to introduce to you Dr. John Walton. I first met Dr. Walton when I was 18, uh, uh, attending the Moody Bible Institute, uh, now 25 years ago. Uh, I was at Moody uh, to, quote, learn the Bible, as I would have put it. And John had a reputation for being one of the most exacting professors on the, the faculty of Moody. Uh, very hard, but very good, uh, was what all the students said. Uh, so, of course, glutton for punishment that I was, I signed up for what I think must have been an advanced course in Kings and Chronicles, because uh, much of it, especially in those early uh, weeks, was over my head. Um, but uh, he couldn't have known this, uh, but John became for me one of a small handful of teachers that made an outsized uh, mark on my intellectual development uh, in Christian faith. He challenged me to read the scriptures deeply, uh, faithfully, and to take scholarship seriously. And I'm very uh, grateful to him uh, for that role that he played. Uh, after 20 years of teaching at Moody, uh, Walton joined the faculty at Wheaton College, uh, where uh, he got one of his degrees. Um, uh, and at Wheaton, he's been a uh, professor of Old Testament since 2001, so 14 years. Uh, Walton has authored, co-authored, or edited uh, literally dozens of books and essays, uh, far, far too many to recount here. But noteworthy among them, uh, for our purposes, are uh, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, uh, the Old Testament uh, um, volume of that, and he's the general editor of that volume. Uh, a survey of the Old Testament, uh, also published by Zondervan, which is at least in its third edition now. And uh, more recently, the Lost World Trilogy, uh, which is maybe analogous to the, star, the original Star Wars trilogy, the Lost World. Um, but uh, in 2009, he published The Lost World of Genesis 1. Um, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate, uh, and then in 2013, The Lost World of Scripture, and then uh, uh, this year, The Lost World of Adam and Eve. Uh, some of these books are available in the back for you to browse through uh, during the break. Um, John, it is a pleasure to have you uh, here again in the Twin Cities with us. Thank you. Let's give me a hand. really was, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're getting the sound adjusted here. Thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning, well, all day Saturday. Uh, are we going through Tuesday? I don't know. Anyway, so glad that you're here, and I'm looking forward to sharing information with you. We're in an unusual place in history. The war, so-called, between Bible and science, heating up again. It's been that way for a while, I guess, but it just seems to go through these phases, and it's really a big topic these days, and many people do believe that it is indeed a war. Taking casualties, choosing sides. Which side are you going to be on? While it's portrayed as a war, and some people approach it as war, I'm not convinced that it needs to be a war. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I'm not coming here as a scientist. Boy, that would be bad. 
I'm not a scientist of any sort. I have no scientific claims to make. I have no scientific position to promote. Uh, I'm not coming as a theologian. I'm not trained as a theologian. I'm a Bible guy. I'm a text analyst. That's what I do. And the text that I analyze, foremost the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, but also the ancient Near Eastern texts. And I'm going to be trying to draw both of those areas together this morning as we talk about this area. So, we want to talk about text. Primarily, I want to know what is it that the Bible claims. After all, if we believe that there is some kind of war, well, science has its claims in that scenario, and the Bible has its claims, and they're at loggerheads, and you have to figure out which side you're on. That could be true, of course, but we want to make sure that we understand clearly what claims the Bible is making. If the Bible's making claims that are contrary to claims made in the sciences, well, then we may need to take a stand. But maybe the Bible isn't making the claims that we thought it was. So we're going to be taking a look and see what claims the Bible makes. We start with authority, because I always start with authority, because that's the foundation of everything that I do when I come to the biblical text. And so when we try to understand how authority works, we understand that God has a purpose, a purpose that he wants to communicate. He's revealing himself, and he's chosen to do that through a human author. And therefore, that human author becomes the, the doorway that we have to go through to understand what God has to say. So God's purpose is carried out through a human author, through the human purposes, and in that way, he vests authority in that human author. That means that we really want to know what this human author had to say because that's our way to get to know what God had to say. And as we think about that, we discover that the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. Got that? It's for us. It's for everybody. The message transcends culture. But it's not written to us. You know that because you know that when you read the Bible, you're reading a translation. You know that it's not in your language originally. So it wasn't written to you. Not only isn't it written in your language, it's not written to your culture. Every culture is different. And this is written in a particular culture, in a particular time, to a particular audience, in a particular language. We're reading someone else's mail. And we're to benefit from it, but we have to recognize that that requires us to make some adjustments. That is, we have to try to join that original audience. As best we can, that's a tough thing to do, but as best we can, if we're going to get the full impact of that message, the more we can understand it in its context and culture, the better off we'll be. Now, before you get worried about it, it's not as if somehow the, the Bible's truths are obscure to us. But in this, we're not talking about the major truths of the Bible. We're talking about kind of the back details and lots of the intricate things along the way. And for those, we need to try to understand that ancient world. That's why I talk about this as reading the Bible, reading Genesis with ancient eyes. By that, I don't mean the kinds that need trifocals, okay? But with the, uh, the mindset of an ancient reader, because if that's what the author intended, those words, those ideas, that culture, then that's where the authority is, and that's what we have to get to. So, when we talk about the Bible in the ancient Near East, Israelites are part of an ancient world. Um, if you think of culture as sort of a river, you know, that river's flowing straight through Israel. They're part of the cultures of the ancient world. And each culture of the ancient world would draw from that river its own kind of ideas and ways to frame things that had to do with their own beliefs, in this case, the Israelites' beliefs, as God was revealing himself to them. The same thing happens today. There's kind of a cultural river, and people draw from it. So when we look at the Bible in the ancient Near East, we're not trying to import 
ancient texts or ancient ideas onto the Bible as if the Bible is the same as they are. That's not the point. Uh, we're not imposing the ancient Near East, that's A-N-E, ancient Near East on the Bible. We're simply recognizing that the Israelites are part of the ancient Near East. The ancient Near East texts then can prompt us to think about the biblical text differently because they'll help us understand things about the ancient world that we would not intrinsically know. Yet you know, things that all the Israelites understood perfectly well. So if we can dip into that world, so it's not a matter of derivative literature or something like that. The Bible's its own thing and it's unique. God has given it to us, but it is given in an ancient world. So we want to dip into that culture and the ancient Near Eastern texts give us windows to that world so that we can see what people used to think. Okay? So, providing windows to how people thought in the ancient world, that's so we avoid anachronism. We don't want to impose our culture, our issues, our ideas onto the text. We want the text to speak for itself. But if we don't know the ancient culture, we might make assumptions that we ought not make about the Bible. So we want to kind of filter those out as much as we can. Because we want, don't want the Bible just to be a reshaping of our thoughts. We want the Bible to speak as God's word. So we want to avoid that kind of anachronism. And we're going to find some places where that slips in very easily. For instance, when we talk about the world, we have to try to see the world the way they did. Here's our blue earth picture. And you could look at that and have a pretty good idea what you're looking at. You could probably speak at some length about what you see there, the continents, the oceans, the clouds. You know what this is. It's a meaningful picture to you. But understand that if an Israelite looked at this picture, they wouldn't have any idea what they were looking at. They wouldn't be able to, to talk about anything on there. Nothing would be familiar. They wouldn't know what it was a picture of. It shows us the distance. And furthermore, even though we believe that this gives us a very accurate picture of the world, if God were going to communicate in these terms, he'd have to give more information to the Israelites, which he doesn't do. We have to think about the world the way they thought about the world. So how did they think about the world? Well, let's start with Egypt here. This is, gives us an idea of the ancient world. On the left, there's from a tomb painting. On the right is my artist son's rendition, modern rendition of the same kind of thing. We have cosmology here, and you can see how they worked it out. They've got a goddess who's arching over. She's the, she's the sky god. The stars are emblazoned on her body. Down here at the bottom is the earth god laying prone there. The air god is holding them apart because the air god is creating that space where people live. We have the sun god in his boat sailing across. And all of the dots over here on the left-hand side, those are the waters above that are being held back by the solid sky. This is how people in the ancient world thought. This is an ancient cosmic geography. Now, when we portray cosmic geography, we tend to focus on the things that are most important to us. So you can look at this picture and you can say, what is most important to the Egyptians about cosmic geography? The gods. The roles and jurisdiction that each god has. And that's what they portray. Now, when we think about the Israelites, well, that's a little dark. You can't see that very well. I guess we darkened up the slide a little too much. Okay, so when we look at the Israelites, they don't have gods all in it. That's the temple, God's temple up at the top. We've got the solid dome of the sky hold, separating the waters above from the waters below. Everybody in the ancient world believed there were waters above and waters below. That's the ancient cosmic geography. The Bible talks about it. Everybody believed that. Okay, and we've got the pillars of the earth, which you can't quite see here down at the bottom. Uh, we've got the uh, sun, moon, and stars all inside the solid sky. You can see that it's a different kind of portrayal than the Egyptians because the gods are not portrayed. But the basic structure of the cosmos is the same. That is, an Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian would be able to look at this and know what was being portrayed. An ancient Israelite could look at the Egyptian one and know what was being portrayed. 
Neither of them could look at our blue earth picture that I showed earlier and know what it was. That's only a way of saying they have a lot more in common with each other than either of them has with us. And if we're going to read ancient texts, be they biblical or Egyptian or Babylonian, we need to understand how they are thinking about the world. We have to get into their world. So whose cosmic geography is God going to use when he communicates to Israel? Communication requires a baseline of familiarity. God would not use our cosmic geography to communicate to the Israelites. He'd have to explain an awful lot that they didn't know. And he doesn't do it. Read through your Bible. He doesn't do that. Okay, so he's using their cosmic geography, not ours, not the Enlightenment cosmic geography, not the medieval cosmic geography, not the Byzantine or Hellenistic cosmic geography. He is using an ancient cosmic geography. And God's good with that because... God is not taking on the task of revealing cosmic geography. It doesn't matter. He's got bigger things to do. He's revealing himself, not cosmic geography. So he uses theirs to communicate because he doesn't care how it's shaped. That's not a big deal, or how they think it's shaped. He cares about who did it and his role in it. Cosmic geography changes. We think ours is right, but it changes all the time. It wasn't 100 years ago that people believed in a steady-state universe. Well, Einstein, uh, yeah, okay, changed all of that, and we get Big Bang cosmology that's different today. That's cosmic geography. We used to think Pluto was a planet. Oops. <laughs> okay, and so cosmic geography changes. God's not revealing cosmic geography. He uses theirs. We also have to think about text the way that they thought about text. That is, the text can't mean what it never meant. We have the idea that God is communicating an authoritative message through these authors. Therefore, what they meant is what that message is. If God has more meaning than what he gave to that author, how would we get to it? Now, sure, if another biblical author gives us more, that's fine. But that's not what we're talking about in this stuff. Okay, so we have to assume that the message God wanted to come through is the message that the original author communicated. And therefore, if we fiddle around with that, we're fiddling around with God's message. We shouldn't do that. We want to know what that author intended to say. That means we can't make it say what it didn't ever mean. When the Bible says that God spread out the heavens, we can't say, oh, that's, that's the expanding universe in a Big Bang cosmology. I'm sorry the author didn't have any such idea in his mind. And therefore, we can't make the text say that. You say, well, it could mean that. Well, sure, it could mean a steady-state universe, too. It could mean lots of things if you're free to make it mean kind of what you want it to. But that's not the freedom we give ourselves with the biblical text. We want to understand what they thought. Because that's where God's message is. So we shouldn't be reading science in between the lines of the text. Because the Israelite audience... The Israelite author did not intend that science. So, a couple things about science in the Bible. As I said, I'm not a scientist, but I have to know how things work here. And a couple points I want to give you. First of all, observation of natural cause and effect does not remove God from the picture. Boy, let's get over that one. We've, we've got to get past that. This idea that if you can explain it, naturally, natural laws, natural science, natural cause and effect, that therefore God didn't do it? That God only did the things that science can't describe? That's flawed. That's bad theology. It's not biblical, and it's not a healthy way to think. God does it all, whether you can explain it by science or not. 
In the Bible, they don't even have the categories natural and supernatural. There is no such thing as natural in the Bible because the Israelites had no such category. See, this is one of those places where we easily impose our thinking onto the biblical text. We don't even think that, oh, they wouldn't have had those categories. They don't have a category natural. God acts through everything that happens, whether it can have natural explanation or not. The Bible doesn't talk about a category that, like we think about with miracles, a miracle, something that's supernatural instead of natural. That's our world, that's our thoughts, that's our ideas and categories. The Bible doesn't talk about miracles. You say, but I thought it did. Let me read the plagues again. Wait a minute. The Bible calls them signs and wonders. That's not a category that says supernatural. It's a category that says God is powerful. God cares. God can deliver his people. God can act and work on their behalf. Signs and wonders of his love and power. But even that doesn't mean that you couldn't explain them naturally. Maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. It's just not a category they have. So when the Bible says in Psalm 139, 13, you knit me together in my mother's womb, that doesn't mean we therefore have a supernatural act of God that we have to throw out all the ob clinics and all of the um, embryologists and all of that because somehow they're anti-God because they somehow think they can give natural explanations. That would be silly. God knits us together in our mother's womb, each one of us, his action all the time, and yet it can be described and discussed in natural terms. The Bible doesn't recognize a difference between them. God is always acting. So that's number one. That also means then, of course, that we don't have a battle with science over natural, supernatural. Those are just our labels and our categories. The Bible doesn't have a problem. Secondly, there is no new scientific revelation in the Bible. Now, by that I mean God is not giving the Israelites or us through the Bible any upgraded descriptions of how the world normally works, the mechanisms, operations of the world, normal, regular operations. God doesn't give them any new information on that. He works entirely with what they already know instead of upgrading them. No new information. So, for instance, I have heart written there. Um, in the ancient world, they don't realize that what, what the physiology of the brain is. They have no idea. They know there's gray stuff up there, but they don't know what it does. Um, and all of the physiology that we connect to the brain, they connect to the entrails. Heart, liver, kidney, intestines, stomach. Some of you are thinking with your stomach right now, okay? But that's not what I mean, okay? So the physiology that we connect with brain, they put down here. Cognitive, volitional, emotive, all psychological kinds of things, everything down here. God doesn't change that. It could have been an easy corrective, but he doesn't do it. Not only does he accommodate that kind of thinking by talking about all of those things in the kidney and liver and the heart, he accommodates it, but he, he speaks in those terms. He talks about loving with your heart and believing with your heart. He accommodates it. And that's not just a figure of speech for them. That is their physiology. They don't know the real physiology of the kidney or the liver. But God just works with that because he's not revealing physiology. That's for us to figure out. God's given us these tasks to figure out. He's not revealing that. He uses their concepts. Now, some of you might say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. There is, in the Bible, it does talk about with all your mind, with all your mind. That's a word for entrails. Your translator helped you there. Uh, by translating it, mind, but no, entrails. Okay, so no scientific revelation. So we have to consider carefully what scientific claims the Bible might be making. 
if God is accommodating their familiar ways of thinking so that you can get to the more important issues, we have to be very careful to start thinking that the Bible is making some kind of, what, hidden scientific claim or even explicit scientific claim. So that leads us into the theses that I would like to propose for us for this morning. Uh, we have to start with text analysis, of course. Uh, I don't start with science. I don't start with ancient Near East. I start with the Bible and look very carefully. Um, as uh, Brian mentioned in the introduction, this has been my, my life work, my career. Careful, detailed reading of the biblical text. Looking for those things that we so easily overlook. Looking for those things that have connections to the ancient world that are not the same as our modern world. Close reading of biblical text. And it's the hardest thing to do with familiar passages because they just kind of roll over us. We think we know what they're saying. So, when you read Genesis 1, you get to day 1, verses 3 through 5. And when you read in verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Well, you know, you just fly right past that. You've read it a hundred times, and yeah, fine, yeah, yeah, he called the light. And probably you've never stopped to ask yourself the question, why didn't God call the light light? What's going on? Why does he call the light day? Day is not the same as light, and light is not the same as day. Something's fishy here. Oh, no, fish are day five. Okay, but something's not quite right here. What's going on? So let's look at it. See, you have to make the observation before you can even begin your analysis. So, God called the light day. Instead of talk, starting with light and trying to figure out how we get to day, let's start with day and move back. Okay, so what does day have to do with light? Well, daytime is a period of light. Well, that was easy. So God called the period of light day. Okay, uh, grammatically that's called metonymy and that's okay. That works fine. Language does that. So God called a period of light day. And I say that because, of course, that's what day is. And that's how light fits into day. Okay, and the period of darkness he called night. Cool. That's, that's good. Now you move back to verse 4. And verse 4 says that God separated the light from the darkness. Now, if you're coming at the text as a physicist, you might have some real problems right there. Okay, how do you separate light from darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. They're not things that can be mingled together. What are you talking about? Okay, but again, we know we're not dealing with physics. Israelites aren't physicists. Okay, and so we're trying to think of the text in their context. And the same solution we had in verse 5 works in verse 4. God separated a period of light from a period of darkness. Because remember, up in verse 2, we just had darkness. So God separates out a period of light from a period of darkness, and in a period of light he called day, and the period of darkness he called night. Evening, morning, yeah, good, cool. With me? Everybody good? Following? You say, this is easy, I could do this. Yeah, you could. But now I've got you. Verse 3. <laughs> Back up one more. God said, let there be, wait for it, wait for it, think, what have we learned? Okay, God said, let there be a period of light. After all, he had darkness in verse 2. God said, let there be a period of light. And God distinguished that period of light from the period of darkness. And the period of light he named day, and the period of darkness he named night. Day one. So what happened on day one? What did God create on day one? On day one, God created the basis of time, alternating periods of light and darkness. And that time, day and night, is his first step in bringing order to the cosmos. Now, at this point, you should say, time. 
Time is not anything material. Time is not an object. I was kind of thinking that a creation narrative should be about God bringing objects into existence. But that's not what this is. What kind of creation account is this? Yes. We finally get prompted to ask the right question, which we should have been asking all along. Our normal procedure is just to wade into Genesis 1 thinking we already know what a creation account needs to be thinking we already know what sort of creation account, therefore, this must be. Thinking anachronisms. Thinking the way moderns think. Not thinking the way ancients think. So finally, we ask the question, what kind of creation account is this? perhaps alerted for the first time to the idea that it might be a different kind of creation account than we would write, or a different kind of creation account than we would expect or want. And are we ready to read the Bible for what it is instead of for what we want it to be? Are we ready to read the Bible for itself and not just as a something that can be commandeered to address issues that we're interested in. How serious are we about the text? So what kind of creation account is it? Well, now we have to get into the verb for create, bara. You say, well, how many different things could create be? <laughs> okay, let's even work with English. Say you're going to create a committee What if you're going to create a curriculum? A recipe? A masterpiece? Havoc. Think of all the different things we can create and how many different things we mean by it. <laughs> That's English. Now, of course, we can't be satisfied with English. People talk about reading the text literally. And I don't mean to pull a, a one up here, but which text are you reading literally? If it's an English one, guess what? Somebody else already told you what you'd be thinking when they put it into English. And there are Hebrew words that don't render easily into English. So we have to be concerned about what a Hebrew word communicates, not just about what an English word communicates. We need to look at this word, bara. Now, it occurs about 50 times. That gives us a little bit of a basis for, for working at it. It only takes God as subject or actor, so it is a divine activity, but knowing that God is the subject doesn't tell you what the verb does, what action is involved here. Just tell you whatever it is, God's doing it. That could be hundreds of things, okay? So we're going to get an idea of what the verb means, by looking at its direct objects. Now that's the process I just took you through in English. Curriculum, committee, masterpiece, they're all direct objects. And by knowing the direct object, that gives you some sense of the verbal activity. You would know that creating a curriculum was different from creating a committee. Just because you know what a committee is and you know what a curriculum is. So you infer the meaning of bar, uh, create, English, um, from the direct objects. So we need to look at the direct objects. There's a wide variety of direct objects in Hebrew. I've got a list in uh, a couple of the books back there um, of uh, those, uh, the full list. But here's a sampling uh, just to show you some of the diverse possibilities. And you can see that as you look through this, that these are not particularly material direct objects. God can create darkness. Wow, how do you do that? God create darkness. God can purity. Create in me a new heart, oh God. That's not heart surgery, by the way. You knew that, I think. Okay, so uh, there's all kinds of things here. Um, some of the things are 
are material themselves. Jerusalem, Jerusalem was material. You could see it, feel it, okay? But that's not what it's talking about when it says God created Jerusalem. There's an idea that is Jerusalem. So we find out that this verb bara takes a variety of direct objects that give us a large degree of diversity and options as we think about what it means. So we have to try to understand then what the word is getting at. Now, one of the ways we can do that is to look at before and after pictures. Again, if you had no idea what it meant to create a curriculum, you could say, okay, what, what, what was the situation before the curriculum was created? And then what was the situation afterwards? You could talk about creating out of nothing. You could create things out of nothing, but you wouldn't have to. You know, I wish they would learn how to create committees out of nothing. Then I wouldn't have to be on them. They could just kind of create. OK, anyway, um, so we can look at a before and after picture. And that can help us understand what this activity entails. Now, do you notice how I've been asking you kind of to, to I've been trying to give you information that will lead you to clear the table, to say, OK, I thought I knew what that meant, but now I have to think about it again. Let's just clear the decks and think about it, OK? I'm building cases based on evidence. I'm trying to avoid just giving you opinions, although sometimes we can't take the time to go through all of the evidence. But I'm trying to show you the evidence that should lead you to think the ways that I'm suggesting. Okay, so we look at the before picture, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, if we had an account of material origins, as we often assume it is, we should expect such an account to begin with no material, right? The before picture and the activity leading to the after picture. So if it's about material origins, we would expect a beginning with no material. Now, the starting point is not verse 1. Verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, is a title for the chapter. We know that because at the end of the seven days it says, and so in the seven days God created the heavens and the earth. So that's what happened in the seven days. It's not what happened before the seven days. It's what happened in the seven days. Verse 1 is not part of the seven days. Day 1 doesn't start until verse 3. Verse 1 is an introduction, a title. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Let me tell you how he did it. In other words, nothing happens in verse 1. It's just telling you what's going to happen in the rest of the chapter. So verse 2 is our beginning picture. So we open up verse 2 and we say, now the earth... Earth. Where'd that come from? Right, just earth. Okay. The earth was formless and void, tovavohu, and darkness was on the surface of the deep. Deep. The deep? You observing? There's already players on the stage. There's already a set that's there. It doesn't tell you how that set got there. The Israelites, by the way, would not have believed that uh, matter was eternally existing. They had no category for matter. Uh, but they wouldn't have thought that. They would have believed God cr created everything. And I, I do, too. I, I believe that. I won't ask for a raise of hands. But I believe that, too. But see, we're not asking what are all the things God did. It'd be a long, long Anyway, but we're asking, what are the interests of this account? What does this, what part of the story does this chapter want to tell? And that's its own choice. We, we can't dictate that. So here we've already got the, the stage set. Earth and the deep are there. And we find then that the starting point is not lacking matter. It's lacking order. How do we get there? Well, first of all, we recognize that darkness and sea are elements of non-order in the world. This is where we, again, dip into ancient Near Eastern texts. And you can find it all through the Bible as well. Darkness and sea are elements of non-order. I don't use the word chaos, because chaos sometimes has the 
um, implication of evil, um, a negative. And non-order is just not yet ordered. It's not, an, it's not a bad thing. It's not evil. It just, you know, the boxes aren't unpacked yet. Oh, wait, you thought boxes unpacked, not unpacked were evil. I know. Okay, no. Okay, it's not. <laughs> it's just, it just hasn't been ordered yet. So darkness and seer, those elements. So now we have to look at this very important word, tohu. That's not tofu. That's tohu. Uh, they mean about the same thing, I think. But um, a <laughs> lacking worth or purpose, a place where nothing is done. Okay? Tohu does not refer to a shapeless mass. Tohu refers to something which is not yet ordered and functional. So in that sense, it's not a material category, shapeless, that has to be formed. It's a functional category that has to, has to do with order being put together. Again, I've got a list of all the uses in the book and go through them all. So tohu, that first word, formless, is really more like functionless or orderless. Now, Egyptian has the same kind of concept, and we see it there. They talk about the non-existent. And it's interesting, they'll call the, the Mediterranean, the cosmic ocean as they would have thought of it, they'll call that non-existent. And we say, what? I mean, what do you mean non-existent? I see it, I can touch it, I can splash in it. What do you mean it's non-existent? You must have a different idea of existence than I do. Yeah, got us again. We even impose our concept of what constitutes existence on the ancient world. And it's a different one from what they had. Wow. Okay. You see what we're doing? I'm doing all of this ancient world comparison so we can get to the authority of the text without reading our own issues into it. Okay? So, the non-existent. Tohu. The non-existent. It's without order. And if it doesn't have order and function, then it's non-existent. Bara, create, is to move something from non-existence to existence. But if you've got a different definition of existence, that's a different kind of activity. Now let me try to explain something quickly. The biggest objection that people have to the view I'm presenting is that they say, what do you mean something that doesn't have a function? I mean, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, the Mediterranean Sea, the cosmic oceans had a function. The tides, the, the waves, the ecology. The... Think Israelite, think Israelite. They're not thinking those things. When they talk about function and order, they're talking about those things as having a very specific object, us. It's not a matter of whether they are scientifically or ecologically or anything like that functioning. Functioning for people. That's how they were thinking. An ordered system for them. A Babylonian creation account, the very beginning, nothing was yet named. That's how they talked about it not existing. And the gods were not named, so they didn't exist. They didn't yet have functions or roles established in the system. Foundation of Eridu, an ancient Sumerian account, all lands were sea. This is how all the cosmologies in the ancient world started. Genesis is telling a cosmology in the framework of the way that ancient Near Eastern peoples told cosmologies. It's not borrowing the ancient cosmology, but it's telling the story in the same way with the same basic concerns and interests, even though it's going to have a different answer about who's in charge. So moving on with the proposed thesis, a functional focus. And uh, as I've done this more and more times, I've done this lecture hundreds of times, I, I've moved more toward both function and order. Both of them are important. Okay, because again, I'm not talking about function, meaning it, it works 
scientifically or something, okay? So the functional focus. In the ancient functional focus, existence is defined by having a function for us, not just a function, okay, a function for us, a role and a purpose in an ordered system, not by having a material structure. Material properties were not the basis for thinking about existence. When the Bible keeps saying it was good, it was good, that means it is functioning properly in an ordered system. Working the way it's supposed to. Like the plane that I never made it onto yesterday was not working the way it was supposed to. You know, when the pilots go through the, the, their checklist, checking the flaps, the engines, good, 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 good. In my case yesterday, Pilots allowed to fly two more hours, not good. Get those pilots off there. Oh, flight canceled. It was not good. So good is functioning properly in an ordered system. The Hebrew word used here is not the word for perfect. Never. Hebrew has other words for that. So it doesn't say that everything was perfect. It says that it was optimally functional. Genesis 1 provides an account of functional origins, not material origins. Genesis 1 is about God bringing order, functionality, into the midst of non-order. That's what creation is in the ancient world. And I've tried to begin to show you that's what it is in the Bible by the language that is used. Tohu, bara. And we've already seen the first day is a function, an order bringing activity, time, not a material object. So I'm trying to show the evidence from the biblical text and then to show what we're finding in the biblical text is the same at that level of what we find in the ancient world. So it makes sense that the Israelites would think in that way. It's fruitless to ask then what things, what objects God created on any given day, for the text is not concerned about the existence of matter. If you ask the Israelites, did God create all of the matter? They wouldn't know what you're talking about. Just like they don't have a category for natural, they really don't have a category for matter. So you see, that's our world, not theirs. They really wouldn't care about the issue of matter. Now you say, oh, I can't imagine a world like that. Well, yes, you can. Because there are some places, selectively, where we do it too. For instance, how many of you have done some concentrated research to try to understand the polymers that are used in the casing of your laptop? I, uh, one, I see a chemistry major over there, okay? Sure. And in certain levels of chemistry, there but for the grace of God. Okay. Um, they, they care about the polymers in the laptop. But you don't. You care about how it functions. You care about the ordering in the operating system and your applications. You care about how it works. You don't care what it is. You don't care about the soldering on the motherboard. Did I get you on that one? Okay. You don't care about the soldering on the motherboard. You don't care about the matter. You know it's there, but it, it just doesn't, you never even think about it. You care how it works. See, we can do this. We can do this. Naming and separating, both in the Bible and the ancient Near East, are the acts of creation, because those are the things that define order and function. And you've seen that all the way through the biblical text. You just haven't paid any attention to it. Now, to try to have, this is the hardest part to get your brain wrapped around. So I'm. I'm yeah, beating the dead horse for a while still. Um, trying, trying to understand this concept. One of the most helpful illustrations is the difference between building a house and making a house a home. The material story is the house story. The function and order story is the home story. Okay? So set those up in your mind, and let's talk about it for a minute. 
building a house. You know, we're talking about the framing, the foundation, the roof, the electricity, the plumbing, the heating, air conditioning, right? All of the physical material stuff of the house. There's an origin story there. You, you may or may not be able to tell it about your own house. Maybe you had your house built and you spent way too much time on that than you ever wanted to spend. Or maybe you moved into the house and you have no idea about those things except when one of them goes wrong. Okay, but there is that origin story of the house. Now, if we move that to the cosmos level, okay, with the cosmos, the uh, house story is what science spends time exploring. That's its job. It tries to understand everything it can about this house, whether that has to do with astrophysics or whether it has to do with molecular biology. This house or this house, the material story is what science focuses on. And we've, of course, become so enthralled with all of the things that science gives us in terms of knowledge and in terms of the, the way our world works and advances that we've really become increasingly interested in the house story. Yet at the same time, we found that as the scientists open up uh, our knowledge of the universe, and we learn about that we're just kind of a planet around one star, and there are billions of stars in our galaxy, and billions of galaxies with billions of stars, and we start to feel really insignificant. Because in the house story, we're not even a termite in the universe. But there's another story. Because at some point, the house you live in became your home. And in the home story, we have significance because our home functions for us. It's ordered for us. We have a room in our house that was designed to be a formal dining room. You can tell that by its location, by the way that it's decorated and everything like that. That's what it was supposed to be, a formal dining room. We had no need of a formal dining room. And we didn't want to waste the room by having it be a formal dining room that we never used. And so we decided we were going to make it a den. We put bookshelves in there. We put the computer in there. We put a futon in there. We decorated it as a den. We organized it as a den. We ordered it as a den. We use it as a den. We call it a den. We created a den. In the home story, it's a den. Even though in the house story, it was a formal dining room. Home story talks about how it works for you. When people are getting ready to buy a new house and the family goes to visit, you know, sometimes uh, the dad will go looking at all the electricity and the plumbing and uh, the foundation, you know, all of that stuff, check out the house. Sometimes maybe the mom would do that too. I think my wife would do a better job with that than I would. But anyway, um, one of them will take a look at the house. You've got to do that. But then others will be looking at the home. Well, whoa, whoa, how are we going to use this room? Where are we going to put the furniture? How are we going to arrange it? And the kids are running around, this one's my room, this one's my room, right? And learning about the home. You can look at it both ways, house or home. And the origins of the home is every bit as important as the origins of the house. If the house were standing empty for two years, is it functioning? Well, as a house, it could be. The water's there. If somebody would turn on the faucet, the electricity's there. The roof is still working. It's protecting from the rain. The foundation is holding up the walls. It's functioning as a house but it's not functioning as a home. And when I talk about Genesis 1 being a story of the functional origins, I'm talking about its functions as a home, not its functions as a house. That means somebody's got to be living there. Can't function as a home if nobody's living there. And Genesis 1 is about how the cosmos is going to function as a home for us. Not how it functions as a house. Again, the house story is one science is interested in. 
And that's why the house story is, that's what science does. That's the origin story they want. And that's fine, I don't object to that, but it's a different origin story. When Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, John 14, he's just told them he's going to be going away. They're not happy campers. And Jesus said, don't worry about it. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he's not talking house. He's talking home. I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you might also be. It wasn't just preparing a home for them. It was preparing a home where he would be with them. And that's not the first time he did that. That's what's going on in Genesis 1. Not just a place for us, but a place where he will be with us. And when we focus so heavily on the house story, we lose the truth of the home story. And that's bad. Because it's the home story that the text is trying to give us. We're on our guests. So welcome to God's bed and breakfast. That's what people do when they make a bed and breakfast. They prepare a place for people to come. And they want it to function for them, not just for the, the hosts. They want it to function for their guests. But certainly also the idea is that then the hosts will be there with the guests and interacting with them and getting to know them. It's about relationship. And that's how that place is supposed to function, for relationship. It's ordered for that to happen. You getting the idea? Function, not material. So in Genesis 1, God creates time. In Genesis 2, uh, I'm sorry, day 1 is time. Day 2, um, he sets up, sometimes people think it's a solid dome. The Hebrew word's rakia. And... Uh, actually, in one of my books, I say that it's a solid dome, but I've changed my mind. Can do that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, I w and the reason I changed my mind is not because I concluded that the Israelites didn't believe in a solid sky. They did. I just found another Hebrew word that I think means that instead of rakia. So, anyway. So, the rakia, instead of being the solid sky, which has another Hebrew word for it, is the space when the separation of the waters, waters above, waters below, that living space, not in the waters, since we don't have gills, is for us, and it's the living space. But space, of course, is not material. And don't talk to me about hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, they didn't know those things. Space is not material. So time is not material, space is not material. That creating the space with the waters above, waters below, talks about how their weather systems, how they understood them. Those waters above, waters below, right? That's, that's how meteorology works. So you could say on day two, God created weather. On day three, it says, let the waters be gathered and the dry land emerge. It doesn't say he made the waters in the dry land. He did, of course, but that's not this story. That's, a, that's another story. But now he's organizing it, ordering it. Waters emerge, dry land, I'm sorry, waters gather, dry land emerges, and then let the plants grow and sprout. It doesn't say he created plants. He makes the system work. Ah, function, order. And that system, uh, a wheat plant grows and drops wheat seeds and another wheat plant grows. Wow, and every time another wheat plant grows. This is really cool. It's lost on us, it, you know, happens so often. But, wow, and God made that regularity happen. Now, of course, it would be really interesting if your wheat seed dropped and a barley plant grew, and God could do that too if he wanted to, but this is telling us he set up the system to work the way that it does. And as a result, on day three, God created 
food. These are days one through three then talk about the three principal functions of human existence. No matter what culture, no matter what time, no matter how advanced or primitive you might be, time, weather, and food have always been the major issues of human existence. Every conversation at the supermarket, at the water cooler, at the bus stop, eventually it's down to time, weather, and food. That's who we are. It's what we do. Time, weather, and food. God set up the world to work for us. Function. Order. No material objects here. Certainly there are material objects. The plants are material. But it's not talking about God manufacturing material objects. It's order, organizing. It's the home story. I mean, after all, the sofa that I move into the den, the futon that I move into the den, is a material object. But I'm not talking about who made the futon. I'm ordering the den that I created. <laughs> Time, weather, and food, days one, two, and three. So first three days, the principal functions of our existence. Days four, five, and six talk about the functionaries, the, one, the things that operate in those. But it's still functional. When it says, God made the sun, moon, and stars, we say, ah, uh -huh, they're talking about, that's material. Nope. First of all, point number one, Israelites, anybody in the ancient world, Israelites included, didn't know that the sun, moon, and stars were material objects. How would they? They don't know the moon is a rock in orbit reflecting the light of the sun. So when they talk about sun, moon, and stars, they're not talking about material objects. They don't know they're material objects. And what do they call them? Lights. Lights. In the ancient world, they thought that the stars were engraved on the underside of the sky. Remember the Egyptian picture? The stars on the, the sky god's body? Engraved on the underside of the solid sky. They don't know they're objects. So when they say God made the lights, right? they don't say sun, moon, and stars. God made the lights, and he made them for, the text tells us, signs, festivals, days, years, functional for us, home story. Genesis 8, 22, after the flood, tells us as long as the earth endures, God is restoring order after the flood. Order was obliterated by non-order, the waters. Order is being restored, and as long as earth endures, seed time and harvest. Oh, that's food. Cold, heat, summer, winter. Oh, that's weather. Day and night. Huh. Time. Does the Bible know it's dealing in these three categories? Of course. Functional categories. Order. Now, but you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I read through Genesis 1 and keep saying, God made, God made, God made. That sounds so much like material objects. That's because you're reading English, and that's because that's the English word that your translator gave you. Mm. Asa is one of the most frequent of Hebrew verbs, 2,600 times. Oh, that's a difficult word study. But you'll find that it's translated dozens of different ways. Okay, so what does it mean? It means asa. Sorry. And so what's the range that's covered? Now, that's a better question. What's the range that it covers? When Hebrew students learn the verb, it's the first verb they learn often, they learn to do or to make. Wait a second, those are very different things. Doing and making are very different things. Well, that's just the beginning. And we start to look at some uh, examples of its usage. In Genesis 3.21, God makes, and all these are the same verb, garments for Adam and Eve. Okay, see we're back to curriculum and committees and, right? looking at the direct objects. God made garments. In Amos 5.8, God makes the constellations? Hmm, that's an ordering of stars as we see them. 
The servant formed, that's that same verb, asa, in the womb. It involves supervising, commissioning, delegating, all sorts of activities. In fact, a list of all that God does, not all, but some of the things God does, it's filled with functions in Job 37. And what we learn from all of this is that this verb indicates a role in causation, but does not specify what level of causation. Any involvement by God at any level still constitutes asa. Therefore, you can't read God asas and assume that it is a very direct, poof kind of act. Any role in causation could use asa. So God could make the sun, moon, and stars through the Big Bang. That would still use asa. I'm not arguing for all of that, but that... God made all of us. We read God made Adam and Eve, and we say, see, see, God made Adam and Eve. Wait, God made all of us. No matter what process was was involved, God's doing it. God assaws everything. So it really doesn't tell us much scientifically It doesn't tell us much about the house story when we read the verb asa. Not specific enough. Now there's a second part. We've said that it's for us. God is preparing a place for us, but we've also seen that there's another aspect to it. So that where I am, you might be also. That's what we referenced in John 14. So there's another aspect to this home story. I've already used the bed and breakfast analogy. There's not just the idea that it's working for us. There's also the assumption of relationship. Now, I've gotten to the point, I I hope it's not just old age kicking in, uh, and therefore I'm less patient, but I've gotten to the point where I really get annoyed when people talk about the six days of creation. But the fact is, we don't know what to do with number seven when we're thinking that it's a house story. Seventh day makes no sense in a house story. That should be one of the things that should lead you to understand that maybe it's not a house story. But we read day seven and we get confused. We say, why would God need to rest? It's baffling. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't, you know, why would God need to rest? And we furthermore say, well, what does God resting have to do with creation? What's it doing here? And we end up thinking that it's a house story. We say, oh, this must be just sort of a theological footnote, an appendix for the theology of Sabbath, which some Israelites did sometime. And we end up just... You know, might as well put it in brackets or at an asterisk at the bottom of the page. It means nothing to us. And that's because we have no understanding of the ancient world. You see, any Babylonian or Egyptian or Assyrian or Canaanite, if they read Genesis 1, one of the first things they would say is, what a cool temple story. And we would look at them and say, what in the world are you talking about? Temple. It doesn't say anything about temple. And they would say, well, you're not from around here. Because to them it was obvious, even though the word temple is not used. Because in the ancient world, gods rest in temples. And temples are constructed for deity to rest in. If you've got a divine rest, you've got a temple. It's obvious if you live in the ancient world, not to us. Well, so how's that all work out? Temples are the command center of the cosmos. They say, okay, that that doesn't compute in my mind. Rest and command center don't look like they go together. 
even though we know that the president rests, sleeps in the White House, and that that's also the command center for the country. But it's also because we really don't know the theology of rest in the Bible. I can just hit a couple high points quickly. When God tells the Israelites that he's going to bring them rest from his enemies all around, is he telling them he's going to give them more leisure time, more downtime, uh, time for computer games? Uh, what? what? What's he telling them? Well, no. He's, by giving them rest, he means they're going to have the opportunity to live life without it being disrupted by their enemies. Not that they wouldn't live life, that is, they're resting, but that they can live life without being bothered. It allows life to go on normally. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you naps. Oh, wait, no, no. It's not naps. I will give you rest. What's he talking about? Read the next line. Take my yoke upon you. But it's light. It's... Rest is not relaxation. Rest is not leisure. Rest is equilibrium. It's things working the way they should. And when Jesus tells them to come into his kingdom, it is a higher order of living. I will give you rest in a kingdom mentality. God ceases his ordering activity. That's the verb Shabbat. That's a ceasing. He has ordered it all, and now he is going to rule it. Ceases his ordering. It's not fully ordered. It's optimally ordered. It's good. And now he's going to begin taking command. And the temple is the command center in the ancient world. Command center of the cosmos. Look at this psalm. This makes it all clear here. Go to his dwelling place. That's the temple. Worship at his footstool. That's the ark. Come to your resting place. See, the Bible knows this. The resting place is the temple. Dwelling place, resting place. Okay? For the Lord has chosen Zion, desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place. Here I will sit, there it is, enthroned. His resting place is his ruling place. By resting, it doesn't mean he sleeps there. It means he has taken up his residence there and made it his center of operations, the place of his rule. When God is in a place, it is sacred space. And temples usually delineate that center of sacred space where God's presence resides, where his work is being carried forth. That's what a temple is. So the temple marks sacred space. In Genesis 1, God is ordering the world for people to be there, for it to work for them, and for it to be sacred space because he intends on being there too. It has to be ordered as sacred space because God is coming to reside there and to rule from there and to be in relationship, reside, rule, relationship. I could preach this, okay? This is what it's for. This is the home story. Whose home is it? It's God's home set up for us where we can relate to him. And we read Genesis 1 over and over and we never see that because we're too interested in the material house story because that's what our world tells us that an origin story ought to be. So, People may be the climax of the six days because God is making it work for us. God doesn't need signs, seasons, days, and years, okay? He's making it work for us. 
But rest is the climax of the creation account. If you only have the six days, this is worthless. Godless. It's that God is coming to rest. Rest is the main goal of creation. God's rest. Resting expresses control over an ordered system. And it involves engagement, not disengagement. We tend to think rest means to disengage. Not in the Bible. Not in creation account. Resting is engagement now in the system has been ordered. Now you move in and make it work. Think about when you move into a new apartment or a new home. Boxes, boxes everywhere. Okay, they're not evil, they're just unordered. And you have to order the new place by emptying the boxes, arranging the furniture, right? And all of that is done so that you can live there. And that becomes the center of your life. You don't unpack it all and order it all and then walk away and never go back. You don't pack it in an order and then just take a nap as if you did it to take a nap. You might take a nap, but, but that's not what you did it for. You did it to reside there and to make that your center of command so that you can engage life from there, not just so you can sleep. Sometimes people say, what did God do the eighth day? He ruled. What did he do the ninth day? He ruled. What did he do? Well, you get the idea. Okay? The seventh day is ongoing because God is ruling. That's what he ordered the world for. Do you see all of the theology that's built into this concept that we never see because we're trying to read it as a science text? God's rest resolves unrest. It's not the opposite of activity. So quickly to pull this section together. So what is the seven days all about? Usually we, we start arguing about, okay. Usually we start arguing about uh, are they 24-hour days, are they long days, or things of that sort. Why do we argue about that? Well, because we're interested in issues like the age of the earth and things of that sort. But of course, all of that assumes that we've got a material origins account. If we think of temple building, as I've suggested that we should with this, if we think of temple building, Solomon spent seven years building a temple. Seven years are done, all the work is complete. There it stands in front of you. You could walk up and touch it, except that you'd be struck dead. Okay, never mind. But there it is. Okay, is it a temple? Shake your heads this way. Okay, no, it's not a temple. Why? God's not in it. It's just a building. It's just a house. That seven years is the house story. So how does it get from being a house to being a home, a temple, a place where God dwells? Well, the Bible tells us. In the picture I've been showing you of that cylinder on the side of the last couple slides, that's a temple building and temple dedication account from about 2000 BC. And so what happens is that after the house story is done, then they launch into the home story, how this becomes God's place. And that's accomplished by an inauguration, dedication ceremony. We have them in the Bible. We have them in the ancient Near East, all over the place. And in that inauguration ceremony, that house is made functional and ordered to be God's home, where he will live among his people and have relationship with them. That's the temple ideology of the ancient world. And those inauguration ceremonies... Seven days. Not seven days for the house story. Seven days for the home story. 
Seven days to make it God's place, operating, functioning in their midst. And now relationship can happen. Seven days is a home story. Now again, I have no trouble then with the day being a 24-hour period. Solomon's dedication, those seven days are 24-hour periods. I'm fine with that. But again, usually that discussion concerns the age of the earth because people have already assumed that it is a house story. If the seven days is like a temple inauguration, the objects are not being made in those seven days, and as a result, the Bible, therefore, has no claim to make about the age of the earth. Could be young, could be old, the Bible doesn't say. When we investigate the Bible's claims in context, both the context of the Bible and the context of the ancient world, we might find out that its claims are different from what we thought. Time for our break. Um, and uh, we have to still do Adam and Eve. That's coming. Woohoo. So thank you very much.